this. I'm Gareth Barlow, and in the early hours of the 19th of July, these are our main stories. Donald Trump says he expects to be arrested by a federal inquiry into his efforts to challenge the 2020 presidential election result. A US soldier has been detained by North Korea after crossing from the south. Meanwhile, President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa says it would be a declaration of war against Russia if Vladimir Putin were to be arrested at a summit in Johannesburg next month. Also in this podcast... Punishments are hard to impose unless the offending dog or owner is caught red-handed. That is, unless you bring in DNA testing. The canine crackdown in a French town that's turned to CSI. But first, we begin in the United States, where a judge, Eileen Cannon, has said she is sceptical about federal prosecutors' requests that the trial of former President Donald Trump for allegedly mishandling classified documents be held by mid-December. But it's still unclear if the trial will be held before or after the 2024 presidential election, in which Mr Trump is hoping to be the Republican candidate. Earlier in the day, the former president said he had been, in his words, targeted in a letter by lawyers for the special counsel, who's investigating efforts to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election to appear in four days before a grand jury. I got more about Judge Cannon's comments from our North America correspondent, Anthony Zerka. It means that she's certainly considering setting a trial date that is after what the prosecution wants. Although she did say that she wasn't inclined to take Donald Trump's presidential campaign in consideration when setting a a trial date, which is what Donald Trump's lawyers want. They want a trial date in November or December of next year, so after the presidential election, because they said uh, it would be hard to find an unbiased jury, that Donald Trump has other legal concerns, that he has the campaign to run, that he just wouldn't have the time for this trial. She did say she was going to issue a decision promptly with more details on when a trial could take place. You have to remember Eileen Cannon was appointed to the bench by Donald Trump when Donald Trump was president, and she has made decisions and preliminary proceedings in this case that have been favorable to Donald Trump. So I think a lot of people are expecting that she may set a trial date that is later on than I think the prosecution wants. But am I right in thinking, Auntie, that while she has made other decisions that have been in his favor, they have latterly been overturned by other courts, so this might not still go in the way he wants? Exactly. So there is a possibility that anything that she decides could get appealed right back up to the same appellate court and they could overrule her. Now, it's not the only political wrangling of the day, is it? Because on the other hand, the former president says he's received this letter from the special counsel with regards to those efforts to overturn the 2020 election result. Talk to us about to what degree that is a setback, if it is at all. I don't think anyone would be surprised that Donald Trump is a target of the special counsel's investigation into the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Now, Jack Smith, the special counsel here, is the same special counsel who indicted Donald Trump on those uh, mishandling classified information and obstruction of justice charges last month. And before he made that indictment, he also provided a letter to Donald Trump saying he was a target of that in- investigation. So uh, I think a lot of people uh, are rightly reading into this that there is a, an increasing likelihood that Donald Trump is going to be indicted once again, although in this case is going to be indictment and a trial if it happens that would take place most likely in Washington, D.C., and not in southern Florida, where all of these uh, uh, these proceedings that we were just talking about uh, were taking place today. Anthony Zerka. Next to Seoul and South Korea's Ariang TV channel. A U.S. citizen has crossed the military demarcation line separating the two Koreas without authorization from the South Korean side into the north during a tour of the joint security area. That's according to the U.S.-led U.N. command on Tuesday. It says the person is believed to be in North Korean custody. The man, an American soldier not in uniform, was on an organized tour of the area that divides the two countries. CBS News has reported that the soldier was already facing disciplinary action and was being escorted home to the United States, but managed to flee the airport and join the tour group. Haley Ott, a reporter with CBS News, spoke to a witness who was on the tour. 
The witness I spoke to said that they had joined this group to go visit the DMZ, as many people do who go to that part of the world. And they had just come out of a building when a man who was part of their tour laughed loudly, sort of ha ha ha, and then ran off in towards North Korea and disappeared. And everybody was stunned the witness said for a moment, and then immediately jumped into action. The members of the group were ushered inside. They were spoken to. They gave statements. The the person who had run off was identified, and then the tour group was taken off-site. Well, the border between the two careers is one of the most closely monitored and secure borders in the world. So how exactly was it possible for someone to just walk across? A question for the defence analyst, Jonathan Marcus. The bizarre thing is that this soldier appears to have been up uh, under military charges. It looks as though he was being returned back to the United States. And somehow he eluded his escort uh, at Seoul Airport, uh, managed to book himself onto one of these uh, tours. Uh, And when he got uh, to this part of the border, he uh, willingly uh, went across and is now in North Korean uh, custody. So a, a pretty bizarre episode all round. Do you think this is much of, and if so, how much of a propaganda coup for Pyongyang? It's certainly a very difficult episode for the Americans and indeed for the South Koreans and the UN authorities. Uh, Of course, what it does for the North Koreans is it puts them very much back in the headlines, which is where they like to be. North Korea, of course, is uh, developing its nuclear and missile programs. Uh, It is always trying to get the attention of Washington, uh, irrespective of uh, other international problems that may be uh, occurring at the time. And this, of course, certainly uh, puts uh, North Korea and US relations very much firmly back in the spotlight. And building on that, this all comes as a US submarine armed with nuclear weapons docked in South Korea for the first time in, in 40 years. What, what does that say? Yes, indeed. It's, it's very much a distraction from that as well. Well, that visit uh, by the uh, USS Kentucky, which is an Ohio-class uh, ballistic missile-carrying submarine, came on the same day, actually, that there was a first meeting of a new grouping, the Nuclear Consultation Group, uh, which where, where basically the Americans and the South Koreans sit down. It's all part of trying to reassure the South Koreans uh, that uh, the American nuclear umbrella covers them. Uh, that they don't need to resort to their own uh, nuclear weapons program in the face of what's going on uh, in the North. Uh, So it was a highly symbolic visit by that uh, submarine uh, to a South Korean port. Uh, And as I say, whilst uh, that was the the main sort of diplomatic message that the Americans and the South Koreans would have been wanting the focus to be on, uh, this uh, episode with this errant uh, US soldier uh, has clearly distracted from that. The voice there of Jonathan Marcus. So then, what kind of treatment can the soldier expect at the hands of the North Korean authorities? According to Greg Scarlettio, Executive Director of the Committee on Human Rights in North Korea, there are several historical precedents. In the 1960s, Charles Jenkins, James Dresnock, um, Apshur, Sergeant Parrish in 1982, a private first class white. They all made this terrible decision of crossing into North Korea. The only one who got out of North Korea was Charles Jenkins, married to one of the Japanese abductees. Two of them died at a very young age in their 20s, allegedly of heart attacks. White who defected in 1982, supposedly drowned and his body was never found. Those who stayed in North Korea were forced to act as propaganda tools of the North Korean regime. They acted in North Korean movies as the evil American. Now, even the sons of James Dresnock, uh, he had two sons with a Romanian abductee, even his sons have appeared on North Korean propaganda. This gentleman will come under tremendous pressure for two reasons. Number one, he was a member of the the U.S. Armed Forces, so they will try to pump information out of him. Number two, they will try to coerce him into becoming a propaganda tool. Some of the former servicemen who crossed into North Korea were broken. Some were not, and 
supposedly they died of, of heart attacks and drownings. Uh, we, we do remember the story of Otto Warmbier, a uh, University of Virginia student who traveled to North Korea on a tour. He uh, stole a slogan containing the words of Kim Jong-il. He was arrested, put on trial, imprisoned, put into a coma, returned home, and passed away one week later. So the treatment of foreign prisoners in North Korea has not been good. And this goes back to the man who first disclosed the existence of the North Korean political prison camps. This was Ali Lameda, a Venezuelan national. Together with Jacques Sedio, a Frenchman who had fought in the Spanish Civil War, they decided to go to North Korea to translate the works of Kim Il-sung. They misspoke. They were sent to a political prison camp. Sedio died later. The Romanian president, Ceausescu, interfered on their behalf. They let them out, but Sedio died. Ali Lameda came out of the country to tell his story. So, of course, the people of North Korea are treated awfully. There are 200,000 men, women, and children held in political prison camps. Of the, the foreign nationals who were held there, in the overwhelming majority of cases, the conditions were terrible, and he's probably already undergoing investigation and harsh interrogation. We can take it for granted, can we, that there will be intense interrogation for this U.S. soldier, torture? 100%. Any American who uh, arrives in North Korea is considered to be a spy. So their first question is going to be, are you for real or do they send you here? The second question, what kind of information can you provide? The third item, trying to convert him to a propaganda tool. And that process may take time, but we all have our breaking point. We can assume that this soldier knew nothing of the fate that awaited him when he walked over the border then. I doubt that he knew what was awaiting him because uh, nothing can be worse than being detained as an American, an American member of the armed forces in North Korea. Greg Scarlett here there, talking to my colleague Paul Henley. A blistering heat wave has caused temperatures to approach record levels across western and southern parts of the United States, and it shows no signs of letting up. Tens of millions of Americans are being advised to stay at home, and the country's National Weather Service has urged people not to underestimate the risk to their lives. From the city of Las Vegas, Sophie Long reports. Las Vegas is a party town, and not everyone has been heeding the advice to stay indoors. Hot, girl, hot. This is probably the hottest I've ever been in my whole life. Yeah. What are you doing to stay cool? Probably drink more, maybe. Yeah, drink more. Drink more. The uh, daiquiri by the pool was nice. In the days since the heat wave struck, the number of calls to emergency responders from people with heat-related issues have soared along with the temperature. It's extremely dangerous. When you start to get into temperatures that are in the one teens, going outside for any type of activity puts you at risk. We already started to see a 40% increase in the call volume. Damon Schilling's been a paramedic in Las Vegas for more than 20 years. It absolutely is life-threatening. So we see people that are having their hearts racing, people that are passing out, people that are really being overwhelmed by the heat that we're seeing here in the valley. But people still have things they need to do. They need to go to the grocery store. They need to be outdoors for various reasons. And so long exposure to these high temperatures can be fatal. Las Vegas is in the desert. People here are used to dealing with the heat, but not like this. This is extreme, even by Las Vegas standards. So I'm just on the strip outside the Parisian, and, I mean, it's evening now, it's 6 o'clock, but it's still incredibly hot. You can feel the heat coming from the pavement through your shoes, and I'm just watching tourists go past this restaurant with misters, and their faces are lighting up with joy. Actually, I might, I might try it. Normally I'd be too vain because it'll ruin your hair, but, I mean, that's how hot it is. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Sam, you got to try this. Sam's our producer. Oh, man. <laughs> That's good. And all magenta means is that it's been red for 48 hours or more. Right. So in these places, even here in Las Vegas, um, you can see that we've been, even today, we've got areas where extreme risk and uh, major risk are there. And then that threat really doesn't change much over the next mm -hmm. several days. What's happening here, according to meteorologist Trevor Boucher, could be partly attributed to global climate change, but also to more localised climate change, resulting from rapid development. You've seen a lot of urban sprawl. Now, what happens as a result is that you see a lot of 
the, the inability for us to cool down at night because we have a lot of materials that keep the temperature high. And that is something that's unique to Las Vegas. Other towns have had that too, to a degree. But we are unfortunately the leader when it comes to how much that's affect our minimum temperature since the year 2000. So the advice from the authorities is very simple and clear. Stay out of the heat, stay indoors, ideally with aircon. I'm just going to uh, take some of the advice and go to this casino. Wow. <laughs> I mean, the difference. How nice is that? Amazing. <laughs> Of course, not everyone has access to air conditioning. Now, the first thing I do is wet my hair, then I drink, and just keep hydrating, because we are Vegas strong. There are several thousand people living in Las Vegas who don't have homes to go to. Some make their way to places like the Courtyard Homeless Resource Center, where they can find shade and water. We're surviving, but we're sweating a lot. <laughs> I met Patty and Alan Baker there. You know, we're lucky that we have... Um, an access to shelter. Um, they have fans in there, and we I get a, a mat, so that helps a lot. Sleeping on the street is really bad for homeless people. Don't like it, and I wish that homeless people don't have to do it. And we're senior citizens. So. Yes, we are. But you know, we hang in there. <laughs> we, we hang do. in there. We hang in there. Reporting from Las Vegas, that was Sophie Long. Well, meanwhile, vast swathes of Europe and Asia are also enduring extreme heat. 20 cities in Italy are under a heat wave alert. More hot weather alerts are also in place across most of Spain. Meanwhile, wildfires continue to rage in Greece. And the scariest news is that the conditions causing the plus 40 degree temperatures are set to continue. In Italy, they're warning this may be a 10-day episode. John Nairn is the Senior Extreme Heat Advisor at the World Meteorological Organisation. He told the BBC's Evan Davis that every individual should nowadays have their own extreme heat plan. Everything we're seeing is on track for what global scientists have been talking about for some time and in the IPCC reports. So this is what we can expect to see uh, increasingly in time. It's very interesting that they seem to be suggesting this isn't a, a one-day episode in Italy. This is a week and a half of, um, of these kinds of temperatures. And when you look at what's happened in southwest of the US, it's, it's, it's sort of unbelievable that you just get that much hot weather in one block. Yes, well, you're talking about a, a, a blocking system uh, in the jet stream. And with the loss of the polar ice, this is what scientists have been talking about, getting wobbly jet streams. The problem is you've got too many waves globally. And when you get too many waves, they slow down and, and become part. And if that happens, you end up enduring longer spells of this hot weather. The duration of what we're seeing in, in, in southern Europe at the moment. I mean, talk us through what's, what, what's going on and what your expectation is. I think people need to be really uh, cautious and aware and listening out for the minimum temperatures as much as the maximums because we're aware that uh, the longer that people endure high nighttime temperatures is more of a problem. If you can't get relief from those very high temperatures uh, during the day, then that will uh, work on, the, on people. They won't get the recovery they need. And if they're carrying any additional medical conditions such as heart issues or renal issues or something like that, and also very important that they look after their medicines because they can be damaged in the heat and we don't want people taking damaged medicines. And if anyone's got mental issues that they're, they're being treated for, the doctor should adjust their medication because those medications can inhibit your ability to respond correctly to the heat. So there's a few things there that people can do. I put it to people, they need to have an extreme heat plan. They need to have some flexibility in their planning so that they can take responsibility for their own care. That was John Nan. Still to come on the podcast, back in China at the age of 100. According to the Chinese, Dr Kissinger said the US and China should try to avoid confrontation. The veteran American diplomat is still standing. He's still got his opinions, and unlike most centenarians, he doesn't have to go down the pub to find an audience for them. We'll find out what Henry Kissinger told the Chinese. The South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa, has said that arresting Vladimir Putin, if he chooses to attend a summit in Johannesburg next month 
would be a declaration of war against Russia. Mr Putin has been invited to attend a meeting of BRICS countries, but is the target of an international criminal court arrest warrant. Will Ross reports. It's a diplomatic dilemma for South Africa, which as a member of the International Criminal Court is obliged to arrest Vladimir Putin if he shows up next month. But court documents suggest President Cyril Ramaphosa thinks Mr Putin should be left alone, as an arrest would risk engaging in war with Russia. South Africa's been here before. It hosted the former Sudanese leader Omar al-Bashir for an African Union meeting in 2015. He was also wanted by the ICC. A year later, the Supreme Court of Appeal ruled that the government had broken the law and acted disgracefully by welcoming Mr Bashir with a red carpet rather than with a pair of handcuffs. That was Will Ross. The rock band Placebo first burst onto the scene 25 years ago with the single Nancy Boy and its themes of sex, gender ambiguity and recreational drug use. Since then, the group sold around 14 million albums around the world, all of them doing pretty well in the charts. But now the band's lead singer, Brian Molko, is being investigated by the Italian police. And as our Europe regional editor, Paul Moss, explains, it's not the kind of thing that rock singers are usually in trouble for. When you hear about rock singers in trouble with the law, I guess you tend to assume they've been found with, you know, a stash of drugs or perhaps they got drunk in a hotel and threw a television set through the window. That's not what happened, though, with Brian Molko. In fact, he was on stage at a festival in a suburb of Italy's northern city, Turin. And in between the songs, he chose to say this about Giorgio Maloney, the country's prime minister. Giorgio Maloney, eh? Fascista! Fascist, racist, he called her. And I I should say he added a a few fruity obscenities as well, which perhaps it's best not to broadcast on the BBC. Now, the thing is that in Italy, it is an offence to publicly defame the government, its institutions or its representatives. So now the Italian police are investigating what happened at that concert to see if what Brian Molko said actually constituted an illegal insult. So this then is why the Prime Minister is potentially worried about a rock singer insulting her on stage and and perhaps maybe isn't letting this one fly because politicians are used to insults, surely. Yeah, the thing is, though, it's that word fascist he used, which is particularly sensitive. You see, in her youth, Georgia Maloney expressed admiration for Italy's fascist leader Benito Mussolini, who was in power from the 20s to the 40s. But more than that, Maloney's party, the Brothers of Italy, is actually a direct descendant of the wartime fascist party. Now, since she stood for election, and in fact, since she became prime minister, Georgia Maloney has been at pains to put all of this behind her. She insists she's just a regular European conservative politician. Critics point out that the flag of her party still has a symbol on it that goes back to its fascist roots. And some of her fellow party members have been at events where they commemorated fascist so-called heroes. But she dismisses all of this. She says it's political slander, opponents just selecting a few facts in order to misrepresent her party. So, you know, she's going to all this effort to detoxify her image. And then what happens? An international rock singer gets on stage in front of thousands of people and calls her a fascist and a racist. And as I said, added a few other choice insults as well. So now it'll be up to the Italian police and who knows, perhaps the Italian courts to decide whether Brian Molko has committed a criminal act. The details there from Paul Moss. On Tuesday, a large accommodation barge arrived off Dorset on the southern English coast, greeted by loud protests from local people. It will house asylum seekers and is one of a series of measures by the Conservative government to end the small boat crossings, which have brought over 13,000 people to Britain so far this year, and to cut the huge bills it's been costing to accommodate them in hotels. Central to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's pledge to end the crossings is his controversial illegal migration bill, which is set to become law. Asylum seekers will now be detained, and instead of considering their cases, the Home Secretary must now send them to an alternative safe country, and they won't be allowed back again. But it's facing fierce criticism led by the United Nations, which has warned it's in breach of international law and will expose asylum seekers to grave risks. Vicky Tennant is the UN Refugee Agency's representative to the UK. 
So this is really overturning a very long-standing humanitarian tradition, but more importantly, it's not in line with the Refugee Convention, which is really predicated on the right to put forward a claim for asylum and have that claim examined. Our correspondent, Dan Johnson, watched the accommodation barge arrive in port in Dorset and the local reaction to it. This vessel's had a difficult, delayed journey in every sense, and it arrives here as a contentious, floating declaration of the government's determination to reduce hotel bills and stop migrant boats. I'm looking down on the port as tugboats carefully nudge the barge into position alongside the harbour. It looks like a stack of grey porter cabins on water. A whole range of voices are opposed to what's described as basic and functional accommodation. Outside the gates there are two groups. No to the barge, with signs saying betrayed, and stand up to racism, who are chanting, refugees are welcome, but they're opposed to the conditions on board. It has to be dealt with some other way, but the only way it can be dealt with is to speed up those claims so that the men and women can get out there and start working. We've not got enough dentists, doctors, we just haven't got it, so we're all struggling. If those services were improved, would it be all right? No. So it's about something else? It's about the men. The people of its own town are dividing because of this, and we all want the same thing, and that's no to the barge. It'll be another few days before the first 50 asylum seekers step aboard, eventually rising to 500. But that's around the same number crossing the channel every week. The Home Office wants to place more of these accommodation barges around the country, but so far, other plans have been resisted. That was Dan Johnson there. Well, our political editor, Chris Mason, considers the challenges the issue of migration poses for all politicians. The awkward questions land squarely with the Conservatives right now, but the challenge is likely to be no less acute under successive governments of any political colour. For ministers now and then, a question that will probably last for decades. How does a relatively rich country remain sustainably compassionate, deciding who is deserving of sanctuary and who isn't, and how those who are deemed not to be, once that is decided, are put off from trying to get here. A theme at once international and local, moral and financial, legal and political. These are just the latest attempts to grapple with this most gnarly and complex of subjects. Chris Mason. A judge in Panama has sentenced the former president, Ricardo Martinelli, to 10 years and eight months in jail for money laundering. He was also ordered to pay a fine of just over $19 million. Leonardo Rocha reports. The judge concluded that Mr Martinelli used millions of dollars from public funds to purchase, along with a group of businessmen, a majority share in one of Panama's main media groups. The transaction was concluded in 2010 when he was in office. His lawyer said he was innocent and would appeal. The ruling comes a month after Mr Martinelli was selected by his party to run for president again. He will only be disqualified once he exhausts all legal appeals against the ruling, which may happen after the election in May next year. Leonardo Rocha. A two-year experiment to crack down on dog fouling by using DNA has begun in the south of France. It's all part of one mayor's war on public mess and will require dog owners to carry documents for their animals. Harry Bly reports. Many countries have fines for not clearing up the mess your dog leaves in public, but punishments are hard to impose unless the offending dog or owner is caught red-handed. That is, unless you bring in DNA testing. And that's exactly what's being introduced in the southern French town of Béziers. And here's how it works. Dog owners will need to take their pets to the vet for a DNA test or ask the local authority for a free saliva sampling kit. They will then receive a document, a genetic passport, which they must carry with them while walking their dog in the city. Any dog excrement found left behind can now be collected and tested, the owner tracked down via the National Pet Register and then receive a fine of $135. This scheme was the brainchild of the local mayor, Robert Menard, who made street cleanliness one of his priorities in his election campaign. And this is just the latest instalment in the mayor's war on dog excrement. 
In 2021 came this rather different approach, shaming those who didn't pick up their dog poo by shouting at them over a loudspeaker, as depicted by this promotional video. Twelve loudspeakers were installed in strategic places across the city centre. If a dog owner was spotted on surveillance camera not picking up their dog's mess, they'd first be notified by one of 15 pre-recorded warnings over the public speakers, and if they failed to react, local police would